It's a pleasure to be here. This one's called The Library of Atlantis. The library is fish now. Patterns, broken patterns. Talking parrotfish, dancing damselfish. Patterns, broken patterns. We had literature from all nations. Cuneiforms pressed into clay tablets. Hieroglyphics carved on stone. Sacred dogmas inked on sheepskin scrolls. Runes beaten into the metal of sword blades. Ideograms on fine papyrus. Porcelain tesserae forming mosaic tableau. But when the deluge came, we found that nothing held up that well in salt brine, in constant pounding currents. Stones crusted over with algae and barnacles. Even the microfilm collection was inaccessible. None of the readers worked underwater. So we taught the fish to talk, to remember the stories, to teach their spawn to sing. That worked for a while. They could speak in their bubbly, squeaky-voiced way, but they didn't really enjoy it. They started looking for shortcuts to just get it over with. The fish would skip over our favorite parts if they were too wordy. Our literature was shrinking. After generations of scaly editors and redactors had their way with it, we saw they didn't love to sing, but they did love dancing. So to preserve the stories, we grew the coral in fields of poetry, epic sagas over the seafloor ridges, circular mazes of stunning regularity that the fish would follow in a rotating gyre, and then we broke the patterns, just so, just where it mattered, just where it meant something, and the dance told the story. The Code of Hammurabi formed the stately roundelay, and the Epic of Gilgamesh is a kinetic waltz, while the Iliad and the Odyssey have an individualistic choreography. The body language of the Mahabharata is sprightly and complex, and Deuteronomy is harsh and stern and regimented, but you can catch a hint of humor in the flash of fins and gills going by if you take the time to look deeply and the light is right. So that's how it still works today. You want to read a book? You consult the card catalog, which is a team of learned sea turtles and dolphins. They carry you out to the right field of coral, where the fish are dancing a broken pattern. <laughs> this one is uh, called Zeno Tells Arrow. So, Half a thousand years ago, in the Swiss canton of Uri, halfway to Altdorf, half the people were suffering under the tyranny of the Habsburg Empire. The Dukes of Habsburg had sent their envoy, Albrecht Gessler, and he ruled with a silver scepter, taxing the canton half of every transaction. He had pledged fealty to his lords with only half his heart. His soldiers loaded their cannons with depleted uranium shells but their half-life was only half over, and half the cattle were falling ill, and half the fields were failing. Until one day, on the road from Altdorf, he had started on a journey of half a thousand miles with just half a step, when Gessler and his retinue were blocked by the great crossbowman, Zeno Tell, and his son, Walter. Zeno demanded that Gessler and his men leave the canton, leave Switzerland entirely, Gessler laughed at Tell's impertinence and said, I've heard tell of you, Tell, but I don't believe the stories. I don't believe you are as good as they say. I don't believe you have the stones to back up your bravado. But if you're really the best, prove it to me by shooting an apple off your son's head at a distance of half a hundred yards. I say, you can't do it. And there is a logical paradox that will defeat you if you try. Zeno Tell accepted the challenge and had Walter stand against a tree and assured him that if his hand shook, if Walter were killed, then Gessler would be the target of the next crossbow bolt. Walter had seen his dad shoot harder targets, half a dozen times at least. So he wasn't worried. But he was tired of dealing with his old man's quirks. Let's just get it over with, Walter muttered as he took his place. Zeno Tell took careful aim 
and his finger tightened on the trigger, and he released the shot. The bolt made it halfway across the distance, and half that again, and half that again, and it still had an infinite number of halves to cross, and calculus hadn't been invented yet. It was losing steam and losing interest. Walter, waiting at the tree, got bored, got hungry, took the apple down and munched on it. He ate half the apple, and then half of what was left, and then half of that. The apple was dwindling, but there was always a little more left, an infinite number of little mores. He put it back on his head. The nation of Switzerland, hundreds of years later, marks time from that moment, from that infinite regression of ever smaller moments. They tell the story of how their people began, but never of how the story ended. It's still only halfway done. Thank you so much.